Paul is the National Director of Agribusiness um, for the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Um, but first up, I would like to acknowledge the uh, Ngunnawal people as traditional custodians of the land in the ACT and recognise other people and families with connection to the lands of the ACT in the region. I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and their contribution contribution they make to um, the life and the city and the region that we're all very lucky to live in. Um, so pretty much uh, you're not here to listen to me, but of course I do need to thank and recognise the Australian Government's Future Drought Fund Farm Business Resilience Program, which is um, helping us deliver a lot of um, training and webinars and forums and events in the ACT for our rural community um, and it does extend across the border to our New South Wales neighbours, of course. Um, we thank them very much for their, their program that they're um, letting us deliver and their flexi flexibility in delivering it. But like I said, you're not here to listen to me. I will hand over to Carmel um, and uh, Carmel, if, if you want to take over and present um, any slides that you want to just share them throughout your um, presentation. But yeah, pretty much over to you. I'll mute myself, but keep my camera on. Thank you so much. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and I'm also very grateful for you to be giving your time to to listen to me today. Um, I'm I'm a Canberra girl. I, I grew up in Canberra, so um, have an absolute um, fondness for the ACT and the surrounding region. I'm sure it's very cold where you are. It's um, certainly very cold where I am down here in, in Melbourne today. So I, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which we're all um, based today. Um, for me, that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders, both past, present um, and emerging. Um, I'd also just like to highlight, for those that can see it, the um, background. We, um, we last year mowed our logo into one of our customers' um, um, canola paddocks. Um, it was actually in Young. Um, I don't know if anyone knows the Costello family. They were very excited about the project and we um, we donated that canola. Um, we made a charitable donation just to make sure that we weren't sort of wasting it. But it was such a fun project um, and we all had a ball sort of doing it and um, it's actually won a whole bunch of awards. So yeah, very proud um, uh, to have done that with um, some of our farmers. So just to quickly introduce myself so you know who's talking at you. Um, as I said, I grew up in Canberra. I did a Bachelor of Agricultural Economics First Class Honours at Sydney Uni. I worked in mining for a while but have been with the Commonwealth Bank for um, over 20 years. And I lead all of the work in our agribusiness that supports our customers and our bankers with everything that's happening in this nature, climate, sustainability, you name it, space. So I spend a lot of time with our customers and particularly looking at what they're doing to manage their natural assets, how they're increasing their sustainability and improving their financial sustainability as a result. So the topic today um, is planning in the context of the trends impacting ag in sustainability. So there's really there therefore two questions to be addressed. Um, one is what sort of planning is valuable and the second is, what are the key sustainability trends impacting ag? Uh, so I thought I'd kick off with the second question, and I've really got four topics to cover. There's so much to say in this space, um, so I'm going to move fairly quickly, um, but very happy to sort of pick it up in the Q&A, or also to catch up with anyone after this event or sort of take any kind of questions online as well. So the four topic areas would be obviously emissions and this concept of net carbon zero. Um, loss of biodiversity um, and nature. Um, just basically learning new ways of doing things. I'll um, speak more to that when we get to it. And what I really want to set in your mind um, right from the get-go is that with all of this stuff around sustain sustainability, my view is, and the bank's view, is that this is a massive opportunity for farmers. It's positive story. Um, there's win, win, win in all of this. And um, if you're a bit sceptical of that, I hope that my uh, presentation discussion today will perhaps change your mind a little bit. But I, I, really, um, I really caution people just to sort of say this is a big compliance burden on them because I think there's some really great opportunities for farmers. 
So let's kick off with part one, um, which is emissions and net carbon zero. So this is all about reducing our gross greenhouse gas emissions and increase, increasing sequestration of CO2 out of the atmosphere. And as the fourth largest emitter in the Australian economy, agriculture also has an, in, an incredibly unique opportunity um, to sequester enormous amounts of carbon dioxide into landscapes. And most other emitting sectors don't have that opportunity. Um, and of course, CO2 is a vital ingredient for the growth of all of the vegetation on our landscape. So it's um, really important getting that into our landscapes as well. Now, of course, net carbon zero is where the sum of all of the emissions we produce are um, completely offset or more than offset by the, the CO2 that we're sequestering into our landscape. Um, and so what I really say is today it's almost irrelevant what we all think about climate change, whether we believe in it or not. This is happening in an enormous big way uh, and, and we're sort of just really having to sort of move on and deal with it. And of course, most of us have quite a big lived experience these days with some form of changing weather. So either the average doesn't ever happen on your farm anymore, or the rain doesn't come where it used to, or we've been impacted by bushfires, massive floods, um, and droughts seem to be coming more often and they're sort of more severe. So there's some lived experience that the, the weather probably is changing. And of course, the federal government's legislated a 43% reduction in Australia's total net emissions by um, 2030. So that's going to happen. And I don't know if you've sort of across it, but in New Zealand, the, the government there is sort of talking about a world first, which is to put a tax on emissions from livestock. So that will probably depend on how the election goes. But, you know, there's a lot of governments doing a lot of things. This is real. So... Um, Global organisations are what are, are making what we call voluntary commitments. Uh, so, for example, Microsoft, um, CBA, they're committing to having net zero emissions by 2050, which is really what the Paris Agreement is saying, net zero by 2050. At this moment, I will, and the reason I'm telling you all of this is just to really illustrate that this is happening and this is a thing. It's, it's a massive, I, I actually refer to it as a mega trend. I'll just give you a quick definition on scope one, two, and three, because it's really important. Scope one emissions are what we would produce on our farm. So methane out of livestock is about 70% of agriculture's emissions, nitrous oxide from fertilizer use. Um, scope two is are the emissions that you generate using fossil fuels. So if you're using diesel in your tractor, um, and if you're buying your electricity off the grid, the coal emissions from burning um, to make the electricity. And then scope three is everything outside of the farm gate. So if you buy some cattle in, the emissions from the truck that brought them to you. Uh, and if you sent your cattle off to the processor, the emissions of that truck would be part of your scope three. So for a farmer, scope one will be by far and away the bulk of your emissions. Now, if I'm the meat processor, my scope one emissions are gonna be fairly small. Um, I will have some scope too because I've got to have electricity to run the place. But my scope three as a processor are your scope one. So when I buy meat off you, I record your emissions as my scope three. And if I'm the bank, if I finance you as a customer, your scope one and two emissions become the bank's scope three. So I hope that makes sense. It's really important. So when the bank or a Woolies or a Coles or a Microsoft commit to net carbon zero, they're talking about scope three. So suddenly that really unlocks a thought that when Woolies are talking about their scope three, they're gonna to start to be very interested in talking to farmers about reducing their emissions on farm. And in fact, that's happening with a lot of our customers already today. So as I said, all of the big four banks in Australia have made net zero commitments on their scope three. Um, the supply chains, the big supply chains are busy um, locking those targets in themselves. And our export markets are considering things called carbon border adjustment taxes, which is really accounting for making sure that everything coming into their markets are really um, striving to be carbon neutral as well. So there's lots of support that's been built to support farmers in all of this. So particularly the industry bodies and the supply chains are really um, developing a lot of tools, information, webinars, all sorts of things, because this is obviously quite new for farmers and it's coming very, very quickly. 
Um, Meat and Livestock Australia has been on the front foot for almost seven years now. They've got their carbon neutral by 2030 strategy. So the whole world's striving for carbon neutral by 2050. They're going for 2030 because they recognise from a social licence to operate, everyone thinks cattle, methane emissions, livestock are the bad guys, and they know that they want to get to carbon neutral very, very quickly so we can continue to proudly produce this very important protein source. So they're in their seventh year of reporting. They've already reduced their net emissions as a sector in Australia by 64%, which is incredible. And of course, we've got these carbon markets that have sprung up. And that's, again, really symptomatic that this stuff is not going away. And you can get paid and be incentivised to get more carbon into your landscape by making practice changes to sequester that. So in terms of what does this all mean for us, the first thing I'd say um, I really, uh, if I was a farmer, I would be planning to measure my emissions. Now, everyone's really busy. Um, it, it's a hard thing to sort of get your head around. Um, there are do-it-yourself spreadsheets, which are incredibly difficult, or you can pay to use a guided tool, um, tool uh, or as I said, increasingly supply chains um, and banks will be increasingly um, supporting you to do it. So, um, at some point in your plan, I really would um, suggest that measuring your emissions is going to become as commonplace as doing your tax returns. It's just going to be a new part of the information that we provide to stakeholders, and that might be who you supply your meat to or it might be your bank. The second thing I'd um, suggest a plan would need to deal with all of this stuff is just to help you understand uh, sorry, excuse me, um, the plan would, would include an understanding of, of what you will do to reduce your emissions. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is something you, you would do tomorrow or next week, but again, because this is coming, um, you know, over the next sort of year or two, uh, understanding where the emissions are on your place and where the opportunities to sequester more carbon on your place are, and then planning for what those initiatives might be. Now, at first you might think, well, that sounds like a lot of cost and why would I bother? Um, but let's let's just sort of park that and come back to that because I really want to come back to that point around there's, there's opportunities in this for farmers to do it um, and not just cost. So again, so in terms of building your knowledge, I, I'd, be, I'd be talking to industry bodies. They've got heaps of information on their websites. They're doing webinars. Good organisations like ACT, NRM are doing webinars. You can talk to the CBA. Uh, we do webinars, um, internet searches. There is so much information. I guess it's really just when you've got the time to sort of get your head around it. But um, I wouldn't try to do it in one day. You know, like how do you eat an elephant? Chip away at it um, and a little bit every week would be um, a great sort of way to do it. And, of course, talking to farmer groups and, and, and the sort of farmers that you, you have in your circle. So also as part of planning, you will no doubt consider... Um, as many farmers are, whether a carbon farming project is right for you. So does it align with the way you want to farm? Because you do have to make practice changes to sequester that additional carbon. You need to understand the risks. There are risks and there's obligations. They're legally binding on you and your farm. And also, you know, for succession planning, that needs to be considered. Um, but there's the possibility of income if you generate those credits and want to sell them. Um, or you can sort of hold on to them if you're sort of trying to pursue your carbon neutral strategy. The Commonwealth Bank is well, really well placed to support farmers with carbon farming. We have a, a we can buy them. We have a, a trading desk, and we can help you use them to to do some finance. And I know one of those questions around that's already come through, so we'll, we'll speak more about that. Um, but you can you can keep your credits. You can sell them for an income. You can save them up and sell them later. You can save them up and retire them to be carbon neutral later. There's all sorts of um, options once you have a project going and those credits are being earned by yourself. Um, so as I said, um, I think the big ways to reduce emissions um, that you should sort of have in your mind, the easy one is your scope too, which is perhaps going to renewables and getting off grid. Now you're saving, you're reducing your emissions, but the payback there would be an immediate reduction in your energy costs. So this is this idea that investing in reducing your, mission, your emissions actually can um, generate um, returns for you. Another example would be if you do invest in practice change to build soil carbon, 
Um, we know that more carbon in the soil makes the soil more productive and particularly um, holds more water. So from a drought resilience perspective and a productivity perspective and um, all sorts of other benefits like that, again, investing in sequestering more carbon out of the atmosphere to reduce your carbon footprint also has some productivity and drought resilience benefits for you. Another example, shelter belts. If you planted some new shelter belts, you're planting new trees, you're sequestering more carbon out of the atmosphere. That's good for your emissions footprint, but it also might help with your mortality rates for shelter um, for your livestock. And of course, you're getting um, more beneficial insects attracted to your property um, and getting more carbon into, into the soil as well. So you can sort of see this sort of twofold thing, reduce your emissions, and then all these sort of opportunities to reduce costs and generate productivity benefits. Um, and then finally, the other big one for reducing um, emissions for livestock producers is there's some things you can do with genetics. Basically, the goal is how quickly you can get your livestock to weight um, and then out, the, out, out, out on the truck um, and so that they're emitting emissions for the, the minimum amount of time um, to grow them to weight. There's some things you can do with genetics. There's some things you can do with feed additives. And of course, everybody's um, striving to sort of make this asparagopsis or, or bovi is the other one um, to really help um, 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 reduce emissions as well. Okay, so that's a big topic, probably our biggest one for this conversation. And, and that that's emissions and some of the things I, I would be doing if I was a farmer around sort of planning for that. The second one is um, in our context kind of piece is, is this sort of issue of loss of biodiversity and nature. It really is um, turning into a, a, a global crisis as well. It's, it's not going away. It is another mega trend. Uh, and it's a bit of a, a fast follow to emissions. So there's a lot of energy now going into um, identifying where biodiversity and nature is at most risk and what we can do about it and setting targets and organisations and mobilising. It's also very related to climate change. So rem removing a habitat, so land clearing, for example, in the Amazon, worsens climate change. But equally, climate change is, is worsening nature because, for example, melting ice caps, you know, polar bears are losing habitats. Very, very simple example. But the, the two are sort of reinforcing each other in a, in a very negative way. In 2021, the State of the Environment Report um, for Australia was released. Our biodiversity is very poor and deteriorating. Australia has lost more mammal species than any other country in the world and has the highest rate of species decline in the developed world. Not a good report card. The biggest issue in Australia, the biggest ones for us, are habitat loss, invasive species, um, thanks to our forefathers, uh, pollution and soil health decline. Um, Nature is important because it actually gives us things for free ecosystem services and how we use it is what counts. So pollinators are the very obvious example of what nature gives us in our production processes. The big one, I think, when we're considering a, a natural capital plan for our farm is rain. How do we harvest more of it? So is that thinking about what's the compaction level like on your property? How do we slow the rain running across the property? How do we slow it running through that gully or straight down that river and off? How do we slow that flow? Is it leaky weirs? How do we store more water? Is it another dam? Um, is it getting more carbon into our soil so the moisture holding capacity of our soils is higher? Is it about making sure we've got good ground coverage because that slows the flow and uh, gets the water into the soil rather than it running off? So this is an example of looking at your property and thinking, okay, well, what are the opportunities for me um, to improve my natural capital, which improves my drought resilience and my productivity? Soil, how biologically healthy is it? Um, are you having to use more inputs each year? Are you finding perhaps that productivity is declining and is there an opportunity for you to do something there and save some input cost? Um, carbon levels, that's another one that keeps coming up. Um, pesticides, is there an opportunity to do some precision use of pesticide um, rather than sort of spraying out the whole paddock? Um, diversity of pastures, is there another way to get more nutrients into the soil through having a multi-species pasture program, for example? 
um, and nutrients. Now, I'm, I'm certainly not advocating for anything um, telling you how to farm, but just to sort of give you um, an idea of the sort of considerations, um, if one was to have a natural capital plan, which which I just think is so important um, in your in your sort of kind of key strategy documents for your business. And another example, the the one we spoke about, vegetation shelter for livestock. Um, that's that's a part of your natural capital and your emissions strategy. Um, and then sort of conservation, um, you know, how do we improve our waterways? Is fencing off a dam a good idea because that'll improve our water quality and perhaps our livestock productivity? Also, um, you know, attract more sort of biodiversity to that dam. And um, and we also know that manure emissions from livestock are elevated when manure is um, put in water. So another good reason to keep the livestock out of the dam. So as I said, targets are emerging globally. It won't be long before organisations are talking about their, their nature targets as well as their emissions targets. And of course, we're seeing these biodiversity schemes popping up. New South Wales has got a good one where if you plant some particular species, you can be paid for that, very similar to the carbon project. And of course, the government um, recognises how important nature loss is in Australia and is considering a federal scheme, uh, which we can talk more about later. So um, what additional productivity can we get from these free ecosystem services or biodiversity credits? And is that right for you and how are you thinking about that in your plan? What I would say in thinking about these things, um, there's this opportunity to access heavily discounted finance that is being set up. Um, the Commonwealth Bank has CBA's Agri Green Loan highly innovative product, significantly discounted product, one and a half percent off the headline rate for eligible purposes. And it's completely designed to support farmers making these investments, which we hope have these kind of productivity and resilience paybacks or cost savings perhaps. But what I'm sort of suggesting is as part of your plan, um, you're not in this alone. Certainly the CBA um, is really trying to support our customers as they make these investments to transition their properties and their emissions footprint towards these sort of future states. Couple more things, um, learning. I really like to call this out. Humanity evolves and learns new things. This is a terrible analogy, but it's probably the best one I can come up with. If we all think about smoking. Now, both my parents are chain smokers. Apologies to the smokers out there. Back in the day, smoking was very cool. All the cool people in the old black and white movies smoked. Um, and smoking was even sort of prescribed for disease and, and even some sort of medical issues. Well, the, these days we know it's not great. We know it causes cancer. But there's no judgment in that, right? Because it, it, back, back then that's what we knew and now we know more. And I think it's the same in all sectors and particularly agriculture is no different. Um, that we're learning a lot at the moment about practices. And so as part of your plan, I would really um, encourage you to have um, an open mind that perhaps there are some ways that might suit your farm, that might suit the way you want to farm, might suit your natural capital objectives and, and work in with your, um, with your emissions plan as well. So um, plan to learn. There's plenty of change going on is my message. What what groups would you like to, you know, would you learn from? Um, what circles are you moving in? Is there a new circle that you might sort of start to move in as well just to sort of um, pick up on some of these things? There's, there's so much information on the internet. Um, there's so much information on the sort of state government, um, ag department websites, our industry body webs websites. Um, and, you know, so just speaking to sort of some farmers who are sort of doing some of these things is a great way to learn. So um, that expression, the paddock between the ears, I, I just really sort of flag that as a, an element, um, you know, of a planning strategy as well. And this is where I'm going to share that slide. Uh, apologies for those who can't see it. Um, I'll certainly describe it. Um, uh, and... Um, it's just this concept of win, win, win. Again, just coming back to that when you're sort of working through a plan and you're you're actually sort of starting to encounter, well, might have to in, make some investments in some of these things. Well, um, there's a, a definite overlap between things we do to improve our natural capital, things we do to reduce our net emissions, um, and improving our financial outcomes. And so this idea here 
um, of of a of a payback and a and a multi period payback. So for solar panels, for example, if you were to install them on your place um, and then you get off the grid, you have that upfront investment, but those cost savings sort of start to flow immediately for you. Something else like, for example, investing in a, a practice change to get more soil carbon into your soil, and maybe you're even going to do that in a a carbon a formal carbon um, project. Um, there'll be that upfront spend, maybe it's wire and water to convert to rotational grazing or multi-species, whatever it is. The credits usually don't flow for soil carbon um, until sort of, you know, year four or five, but certainly you'd be starting to see productivity benefits earlier than that. So again, this sort of concept of spend some money up front as part of this planning um, and a multi-period payback. And it's really in your mind just being really clear that there are productivity benefits and profitability profitability benefits um, there. And this slide just sort of speaks to sort of where they are. So um, in reducing your gross emissions or increasing your sequestration, you're also reducing your environmental risk. And that soil carbon example, um, potentially you're getting more water holding capacity in your soil. You might be the, the last in to drought and the first out. And if your soil is able to respond well um, when there is a bit of rain next time we're in, in drought, um, you know, you might get an opportunity just to trade some capital just because your, your, your soil is performing a little bit better than it might have otherwise done. And so a more resilient soil and, and these kind of things can often reduce cash flow variance um, uh, and so on. So um, there, there's some of the, the ideas there. So um, just to round out, um, and close out before we, we move to questions. I'm probably a bit ahead of time. Um, what do we plan for? So I'll probably just summarise upskilling and, and perhaps getting some new knowledge, certainly emissions, sources, sequestration and how to reduce your net carbon footprint would be something that I'd say be fairly new to most of us. Um, where are these benefits from investing in natural capital, those free ecosystem services? And a lot of it sits in the soil space, the benefits, the opportunities for productivity and resilience that we can get from things that we can do, perhaps to manage our soils a little differently. Um, and then these environmental markets. So again, upskilling around those. There's a lot to get your head around. Carbon markets aren't for the faint hearted um, and they do take a bit of time to get, um, to get sort of feeling confident about those. Um, so what else do we plan for? I'd suggest uh, measuring emissions at some point in our futures is something to plan for and just having a, a, a plan for your natural capital. I mean, it is really the factory and the machinery for farming. So it needs to be maintained. It needs to be in good working order. Um, and we want it to be building over time because um, increasingly people are looking at natural capital all over the world and, and farmers are such large custodians of land, unavoidable that we're going to get looked at as well. Um, and just building a natural, a natural capital strategy that really helps with drought resilience. Um, the last thing I'd say before I sort of kick over to Q&A is um, to share your strategy with the bank. Um, let's not just have a conversation about your production numbers, how many head, uh, here's the updated management forecast, and just leave it at that. Um, natural capital and drought preparation is such an important part of your business that um, if your bank is not talking to you about it and, and asking you what your, your sort of plans are, we really only know probably half your business. So um, having a natural capital strategy to talk about, which is really just what your plans are um, and how that's going to drive productivity, resilience and help you manage environmental risk um, is just a really, really sort of important thing. And where conversations um, that we're trying to have with our customers are kind of going for the future. So I might pause there and, um, and see if there's any questions. Yeah, if you've got any questions, feel free to um, <clears throat> unmute yourself, turn your camera on if you want to. We can see that Louise has got your hand up. Did you want to ask your question, Louise? Might be on mute. Hello? No, I've opened my, I've opened it up. Sorry. 
Yep, we can hear you now. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, Carmel, that was just a fantastic presentation. Thank you. It was just so like you just it, you just hit everything in such a a, a, a holistic and rounded way. Um, just great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, she was on leave, so yeah. she just resigned. So the acting. Um, we just. Um, I think someone may have unmuted themselves, and they're they're kind of just talking over us. Um, sorry, Louise, go again if you didn't finish there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Carmel, we're, we're a soil carbon farming project developer, um, and we basically I'll, do I'll that, that out. Thanks for letting me know. Your, um, presentation has spoken about. So we work in emissions reductions and emissions re removals. Um, we do full, full natural capital accounting um, and, and all of those things. Um, we've been on this for a very long time. We started in 2007, but um, sort of due to all of the policy changes and the uncertainty in the market, um, we, we pulled back and then entered again in 2017. Um, so it's been it's been a very long journey, and I think we're at a very an interesting point now. We've had four iterations of the soil carbon method, and you know I'm feeling very confident about the 2021 method. Um, and of course, in recent weeks, we've seen the first um, issuances at at scale coming from that method. Um, so. I think um, farmers are starting to realise that these policy settings do have are sitting on you know pretty stable ground, um, and as we are starting to see issuances under the method, there's a degree of conf confidence moving forward that it's a real market, um, and that there are opportunities here. Um, so there's some great things that we've overcome in terms of barriers, um, but the the most recent barrier that is presenting itself is in relation to um, the economic viability of the practice change within the existing business, within the primary enterprise. Um, so farmers are concerned about, um, you know, impacts to profitability um, as a result of those practice changes. Um, and that's our, that's our barrier at the moment. Um, I'm curious to hear if, uh, you are seeing the same kind of barrier or what barriers you might be seeing um, and any suggestions as to how um, we might overcome some of those barriers. Yeah. Thank you for the feedback, um, Louise, when you're sort of speaking to me in miles an hour, it's sometimes um, you're not sure if it, it sort of lands the way you intend it to. So I appreciate the feedback on the presentation. Um, it's very curious what you have raised, that the economic viability of the actual practice change is the barrier that you're encountering. Um, as you would have heard from my presentation, I think that's the most compelling part in some ways. Um, the allure of, um, you know, thousands of dollars of carbon credit income is also um, very um, inviting as well. But um, certainly what carbon farming represents is a step towards some of these new practices. Um, well, maybe they're not so new, but certainly newer uh, in that piece that I spoke around the learning journey. So dare I say it, a lot of people hate this word, but regenerative practices um, where you're actually trying to rebuild natural capital. Um, but certainly what I see is the benefits of um, multi-species pasture programs and getting more carbon into the soil, um, rotational grazing, as a way of resting plants so that they can grow and be more established and harvesting the rain better, um, being more resilient when it does dry out, and also as another way of um, intensively fertilising your paddocks with the, that intensive sort of mob moving around those rotations um, and getting more nutrients into the soil. So I'm, I'm a real advocate for the opportunities that come from the practice changes that you implement to sequester more carbon into the soil to earn more carbon credits. The barriers that I see mostly are more to do with the permanence period, which I'll talk to if people aren't familiar with that, and the legal um, obligations on a farm, particularly when succession um, is being thought about. So for a carbon project, 
when you make a practice change, you have to maintain that practice. You can't go back um, for either 25 years um, or 100 years. Now, why would you do 100 years? You're probably wondering. Well, you get paid more credits. So it's um, attractive to sign up for 100 years. Now, if your entire family is on board with it and succession is not going to pose a problem, well, happy days. That's great. Um, if you sort of got in the back of your mind that you might even sell the property, sometimes people have a question mark whether that will um, potentially reduce the market for their property, maybe even put a discount on the property price. I certainly am not seeing that. At the moment, I'm seeing the opposite. There's a lot of um, a lot of people buying property now because of carbon farming, because it's got that income already set up, or because they want to put carbon farming on it. So I think there's a lot more buyers in the market. The contractual obligations are real. I certainly have seen some disasters, certainly one. Definitely don't even think about signing up to a carbon project without getting some legal advice. You need to understand what's um, um, required of you. And I think it's because of the permanence, because of the contractual stuff that people do um, sort of go a bit slow with it. And that tends to be more of the, the, the barrier that I see, like what's it going to do to my valuation, these kind of things. Great. Thank you, Carmel. Thanks, Louise. Fantastic. Um, now, we did have a couple of questions come through on the registration, so I'll just read those out on Mary's computer. Sorry, everybody. Uh, they're asking you, Carmel, um, what you might know about the new nature repair credits um, and will the CBA take these ACU's biodiversity credits and LGCs as security against borrowing is one question if you wanted to speak to that one. Yes. So the nature repair, the nature repair market bill um, that the federal government has proposed um, was very much in response to that state of the environment report that I spoke about and Minister Plebisic, um proposing a lot of initiatives to um, very quickly address um, nature decline. Um, that bill's been passed in the lower house, um, but it's it's not stuck in the Senate, but it's, um, it's being reviewed by a Senate committee and there are some big challenges with it. So um, hence she's actually um, announced that that will be delayed in getting through the, the upper house. So the big questions are, unlike carbon, it's much more fungible. It's much more of a, a commodity. You know, some carbon on my farm is not that different to carbon on your farm. Um, but if I've got a threatened species and somebody wants to mow down that habitat, um, you planting some trees to attract that threatened species um, in a different state it's not fungible, it's not comparable. We're actually dealing with a threatened species, so mowing down any habitat that it lives in is just very concerning to a lot of people. So if you can't trade biodiversity credits as offsets, and that's one of the big issues that's being debated, um, where's the demand going to come from? And so who's going to pay you as a farmer for creating those offsets if there's no market to trade them in. And so these are the two big questions that are, are really sort of um, holding it up, I guess, because they need to be solved and they're critically important. Um, in terms of the second question, does CBA use these um, credits uh, in our credit applications? So the answer is yes. So um, there are scenarios mostly, obviously, where you can use it as part of your income, your servicing. And there are scenarios where you could use it as part of your security. Now, it's all new for the bank. We're very engaged. We're, we're learning like sponges. And we're certainly, in my opinion, um, open for business and even perhaps ahead, slightly ahead of the game. Uh, we've put a lot of effort into this. And um, you may or may not know, but late last year, November, we did the first pre-finance of carbon credits in Australia. So that deal was where somebody had a carbon farming project and we brought forward um, five years of that income and paid it as a lump sum up front. Now that's that's a more expensive um, um, source of um, finance, but um, for a lot of customers, that's a very, very appealing um, product. Now we don't pre-finance 100% because there is risk that the carbon credits don't turn up. The bank takes that risk, so we only do about half of it. 
Um, and then similarly, if you said we want to um, buy the property next door and uh, as part of our income, we've got this carbon pro project on our farm today. So we would certainly look at that project, who you're working with, your experience, how that project's going, assess the risk of those credits turning up and then potentially very, you know, um, uh, happily um, include some of that income in the servicing. So. So it's, we're open for business. We understand that these markets are here to stay um, and it really comes down to the risk of, I think of carbon farming as not much different to farming any commodity. Um, and similarly, if you're a livestock producer and you want to get into cropping, you'll make some upfront investments. There'll be some risk as to whether the crop will turn up every year um, and then there'll be some price risk. No different for getting into carbon farming. Excellent. Um, we're going for another one here. Uh, it's been a long time coming, but are we there yet for banks to start taking sustainability, ecological condition and farms into account as a routine consideration when processing loans and agri uh, for agribusiness customers? Yes, so that's a very good question and um, uh, I do get um, asked this one a lot and it's very important. So um, I don't know that um, we're completely there yet, but we're, we're um, absolutely heading in the right direction and all of banks, all banks are dealing with how to make sure that they're doing this um, optimally. Um, so Certainly what we've seen as part of all of the trends that I was discussing today is what we would call elevated environmental risk. So because the weather is different and it's more variable and when we have a climate event, they're typically more extreme. So, you know, the flooding in the Kimberley, the floodings on the east coast of Australia, I mean, they're, they're, they're very significant events. And the, the extent of the last drought and how close that was to the, the drought before it, like this increased frequency and severity. We're seeing global temperatures being broken um, on a weekly, monthly basis. The, the, the drought in the US, for example, um, devastating um, what's gone on there sort of thing and the bushfires in Canada. So this is so many examples. So what we would say is this um, environmental risk is sort of heightened, so, so therefore, um, banks are absolutely acutely aware that how farmers are managing for this environmental risk um, is an important consideration when we're banking customers and how we're um, assessing their risk and then setting the, their, their interest rates and prices. And of course, farmers who have planned um, for managing their natural capital in a way that minimises environmental risk are certainly great propositions, of course, because you know that 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 example I spoke about water, that their compactions managed, they're storing water, they're getting as much water into their soil, they're slowing the flow, all of these things, you know, that that's planning for environmental risk. And so um so banks are leveraging a lot of these new tools, um, remote sensing, all these kind of ways of helping formulate better assessments of how farmers are managing for this environmental risk. And that was my very last point. Don't wait to be asked. Tell your bank. Show them your strategy. Um, if it's all in your head, perhaps it's worth getting it down on paper. Um, and if you can see some gaps in it, well, then perhaps, you know, it's around, get, get the family around the table and um, and just, you know, revisit it. What else do we need to be doing here? And, um, you know, get out and and learn what are the options? Um, are there new ones on the table that perhaps I'm not across? Um, get into some new circles and see what others are doing. So this is that planning process, constantly revisiting and then making sure that you're having a good conversation with the bank so that they know what you're doing um, so that they don't have to guess or make assumptions or assume you're not doing anything, um, which we wouldn't. Um, but, uh, yeah, just sort of making sure that the bank's very across what you're doing. Awesome. Um, well, we've got at least one more question here, but was there anyone else um, that wanted to just throw a question out there to Carmel or um, Anna in the room here? No? No? <laughs> 
Well, I'll hit you up with the last one that came through on the registrations if you like. Just find that one. Alrighty. Sorry. I'm just sorry. Isn't that all right? Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, state of the market and natural capital assets with a question mark. That was the that was the question that came through. Could you say that again? State of the market for natural capital assets. Um, I had a guess that someone might have been asking about. A carbon price, for example, or are there property premiums for uh, properties that have very, very strong natural capital? If, if the person that asked that question is online, feel free to um, add to it, um, particularly if I've got that wrong. Um, so certainly the carbon price is sitting at about $29 per ACU, Australian Carbon Credit Unit. Um, it came off quite a bit, got down to 23 over the last few days. And I um, I would say that that's mostly because we've had a big kind of supply influx of carbon credits. So um, Louise was mentioning all those soil carbon um, projects have um, finally received their first payment and uh, some of the ones um, were quite significant. So that, that would be my guess. I did ask our carbon desk to give me some commentary on the price, but um, they're obviously out for lunch. <laughs> didn't get back to me. Um, but the carbon price was um, really high. So um, uh, January, was it this year or last year? The years are all merging. It got up to almost $60. So um, uh, when the um, minister at the time um, changed some of the rules, um, again, we saw a big influx of um, potential supply coming into the market. So like no other, like all other commodity um, prices, um, it'll be determined by supply and demand. Most um, most people would, in, you know, who, who think about this on a daily basis would say that the fundamentals are there for the carbon market and the carbon price in Australia because of those trends that I was talking to you about, because all of these organisations are making commitments to get to net carbon zero. If they cannot reduce all of their scope one, two and three emissions, they will have to buy some offsets. The other thing that happened recently is that the government, um, we have this, what we call a compliance market. I've been speaking about voluntary commitments and the voluntary market. Um, the big emitters in the Australian economy and indeed around the world are actually forced by government to buy offsets. Um, and they have to reduce their um, net emissions by a certain amount every year. So um, it's things like that that give people some confidence that um, there will be a sort of flaw in the carbon price or it will continue to um, prop it up. Uh, oh, in terms yeah. of um, the other guess I had at that question around, do we see premiums for um, pro properties that have um, um, very, very strong natural capital? Um, it's something that I'm very much engaged in conversation with valuers on, and it is something that I would expect to see as people understand, and that's that sort of learning journey piece, learning journey piece I was talking about, um, the productivity and profitability and resilience gains that come from having very sort of healthy, um, strong natural capital. Um, that we would, ex I would expect that that um, people would pay more for those properties. Um, I think the challenge with it is that it's very hard to quantify. The, the productivity dividend from healthy natural capital and because measuring natural capital so that I can compare the natural capital on two properties is so difficult at the moment um, or just still getting established, um, just some of the data to support that sort of analysis perhaps isn't there. Um, I mean, people are smart when they go around a property, um, they can sort of sort it out for themselves some sales. We have seen some quite per perverse outcomes though, like there's quite a lot of demand for run down natural capital properties because of these environmental schemes. People uh, want that so that they can then make all the practice change 
set up carbon projects, biodiversity projects, and then get paid for that renovation. So sometimes we're seeing some elevated prices for properties that you you might sort of wonder why the prices are a bit higher. But I definitely think that's that's definitely got to come that um, though those nat good natural capital sort of managers and properties need to be rewarded in the market as well. Yeah, I totally agree with that one. Um, just before we wrap up, we do have one more question, Anna, um, in the room here. <laughs> I guess I've got a, a few questions. I was just going to ask you, I mean, looking at the alternative scenario for farmers, is there space for farmers who don't do anything or they see their um, farming incomes over time decrease? What are the... Um, and, and also, is there a penalty for farmers who don't manage their land well in terms of, um, I guess, loaning money from the bank? I realise that's the negative side of the story, but I thought that would be interesting to sort of tease out as well. Um, certainly farmers are in the box seat in terms of choosing what they want to do with these sort of trends that we've been discussing this morning. And um, certainly... Uh, people aren't using a stick approach. Everything's an incentive. So um, the carbon market is an incentive. Um, the CBA Agri-Green loan is an incentive. Um, it, it's not in anyone's interest to shut down agriculture because there's no substitute. There's no other way to feed the population. Um, I would contrast that to the energy sector. Um, Capital can be taken away from coal-fired power plants because there's a perfect substitute, which is renewable energy. So the strategy for managing the transition in energy is very different to what we'd expect to see and, and indeed what's happening in agriculture. So if people choose to go slower, um, that's their choice. It's all speculation really as to what could happen and when. Certainly in some export markets, we could see markets close. Um, Europe is certainly leading the charge around these trends. Um, certainly for canola and barley producers exporting to Europe, uh, you have to have ISCC accreditation to enter those markets. So market closure might be um, something in the future. Um, particularly in export markets. But again, at the end of the day, people need food. How far can you take that? I just think the um, the risk of not engaging in the opportunities, uh, you have a lot of smart people thinking about natural capital and why it's important to have it healthy. Um, you might just be shooting yourself in the foot because you're making yourself more vulnerable to climate extreme climate events. Um, you know, if there's some things that you can do to protect yourself, I kind of wonder why you wouldn't. It's in your interest to do it. It's not somebody telling you. It's actually, you know, your business, your family um, um, sort of benefiting. So no one's going to tell anyone how fast to go by any means. No, not in the short term. Sure. I just got one more question quickly. I mean, just you were just talking about the voluntary versus the compliance market. Is there enough product out there, offsets out there for the compliance market. And, and yeah, because it is, I guess Australia is transitioning and regions have been through drought and fire and all sorts of things and just wondering, yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, certainly globally, this is just a fun fact. There, Australia's not the only carbon market in the world. Um, uh, there's one in Europe. There's a big one in California. There's one in um, New Zealand. Um, there are carbon. There are a lot of carbon markets, um, and some of them um, and carbon schemes. So there is another one. It's not tied to a country. Um, um, it's a sort of global scheme. So there's there's lots of carbon markets, um, and there are certainly compliance markets in different countries, and um, and uh, these sort of voluntary markets as well. And there's carbon credits being produced everywhere. Um, Telstra is a very large buyer of carbon credits. As you can imagine, they must generate so much um, uh, emissions to offset in their business. Um, and so their preference is to buy Australian carbon credit units, but to your question, there's not always enough, so they have to go to other markets. And Australian carbon credits are regarded as um, 
very, very high quality because of the rigour in the Australian um, market um, and, the, and the government scheme. I actually did expect that as a question to come up. Um, there's been some challenge to that, but certainly Australia is regarded as very high um, integrity um, carbon market. So are there enough credits? Certainly CBA's view is that there's a high risk that there aren't going to be enough. And so we're very supportive um, of, of carbon projects and helping get them up, both in our institutional bank and our sort of agri-bank as well. Um, but certainly a lot of people are looking ahead and thinking how many we might need, particularly as this safeguard compliance mechanism in Australia sort of continues to ratchet down and those high emitters have to buy more and more offsets if they can't reduce their gross emissions already. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Wonderful. That's great. Um, well, we're very close to one o'clock um, and you've been talking for a very long time, Carmel. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there, there, there was a lot of really good take-home messages um, and a lot to unpack in your in your talk. Um, and I'm, a, and I'm thinking that you would be happy for um, any of our participants to, to contact you directly afterwards if, if they needed to. And um, we'll be sending out a um, the recording and, and a thank you and we can put your details on there as well. Um, and there's a thumbs up there from Nina. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, just really want to thank you, Carmel. Um, it, it was a really fantastic presentation and I've made a lot of notes and I think I've got some ideas for some projects that we could run in the ACT with our farmers. <laughs> um, so watch out, those guys who are online. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, thank you again. Thank you to the Future Drought Farm Farm Business Resilience Program for allowing us to fund these webinars um and, but unless there's any other questions comments from the online or in the room yeah just to want to extend that thank you to you Carmel and um you know we'll be in contact in down the future I'm sure but thank you everyone for registering in and coming along thank you for everyone's time it's my pleasure to be here and yes very happy to have a conversation with anyone after afterwards brilliant thank you thank you everyone have a nice afternoon thanks Bye. Carmel Bye. Thank you.